the 3 p.m. session of the October 26, 2021 meeting of the Henry County Board of Supervisors to order. Uh, I'd like to welcome all of our visitors here today. Remind you, if you want to address the board, you must sign up seven days in advance of uh, any of our regular meetings to be put on the agenda. The county administrator is a contact person for the board. However, the public may address the board under the agenda item matters presented by the public uh, later in tonight's uh, meeting. Uh, again, welcome everyone. Uh, our first item of business uh, to consider today is the items of uh, consent. What is the pleasure of the board? Mr. Chairman, I move that the items of consent be approved. Second. Have a motion, second. Any discussion? All in favor? It is uh, six zero, uh, Jennifer. Okay, she's back in the corner. Thank you. Uh, next item, we do have someone that's uh, specifically uh, contacted the county administrator's uh, office for matters presented by the public. I have a brief statement that applies. This is a time for public comment. We welcome your participation in today's meeting. We're here to listen to you. Uh, if you care to address the board, come to the podium, state your name, your subject matter, and the district in which you live. By coming to the podium, you have agreed you have extended respect for the board and its members. You'll receive the same consideration from the board. Please try to keep the presentation uh, to three minutes. And uh, Mr. Doug Stigall had uh, contacted the administrator's office. I appreciate you having me on. Um, Doug Stigall from Collinsville, Virginia. I was still asking questions on this the health insurance for the uh, school board and the board of supervisors. And uh, I talked last month, but they won't answer my questions. So I'm, uh, the, the correspondence that, uh, that I received from the county, uh, I got it through a FOIA request, the Freedom of Information Act, and they said that Anthem, which is a great company, uh, had said that they couldn't insure the Board of Supervisors or the school board because they were deemed part-time employees and you had to work 25 hours or uh, at least 25 hours a week to get this insurance 50 weeks out of the year. Uh, so they passed a resolution to give it to the SEP. Um, my question was, how can they, if they part-time workers, how can they give it to the SEP and not to other part-time workers? Uh, when I, Joe had spoke up last month and said it had to do with jurisdiction. I didn't understand that. Um, and uh, I know the Code of Virginia says that y'all can get it, but you gotta get it in the manner and form that other employees get it. In the manner and form for a part-time employee, they have to pay for it to sell. This is costing the taxpayers over $8,000 a year to give ever who's getting it. They don't want to, they say it's a violation of their rights if the taxpayers know that they're getting this insurance now. And the way it's structured, uh, the way y'all got it structured now, uh, someone could get on the school board or board of supervisors and just work a few hours a week if they wanted to and get free health insurance. And, I'm not saying that's happening, but I'm saying that's, that's, that could happen. Um, the, the rank and file, um, I want the police officers and the, the, uh, the, the teachers and all to get this insurance is very important to them. And if a rank and file is not working the required number of hours, we know it. I'm not saying no, not, but who is enforcing anything? Um, when y'all say, the information I got from the county, I asked that we, uh, I want to know what the requirements are, and they gave me these requirements. I just don't understand how y'all, if y'all were deemed part-time employees or part-time workers, how can y'all get it and the other part-time workers can't get it? And that's, that's my question. Now, the uh, Marsville Bulletin wasn't print what I said. I had a friend that asked the Bulletin why. They said, well, they didn't have the, the money or the uh, time to verify everything I was saying, but what I was saying came from the county from a FOIA request. Why can't y'all give 
mark their bullet in the same information you gave me. I appreciate it. Our next agenda item is agenda item number seven, a monthly report on delinquent tax collection efforts. We have with us County Treasurer Scott Grandstaff. Scott, welcome. Good afternoon. <clears throat> this is the tax, delinquent tax report as of September 30th. Personal property collection, we've reached 94.60% of the 2020 personal property tax. The amount collected in the month was 44,953.64. Real estate as of September 30th, we collected 95.86% of the 2020 real estate. The amount collected in the month was 94439 Since the 1st of January 2021, TACS has collected $924,768. And our debt set off program has collected $116,456. So far in the month of October, we've had 52 DMV stops collected. Anyone have any questions of Mr. Grindstaff? Thank you for your report. Thank you. Agenda item number eight, we have a monthly update from Martinsville Henry County uh, Economic Development Corporation. We have with us Mark Heath. Mark, welcome. Thank you, Chairman. Members of the Board. Uh, for October 21, several things I'll call your attention to in our business development division. There was a local uh, regional grants overview held on August. 12th or 26th folks that attended that. We had an OSHA attendance um, conference on the 7th of October. There were 12 participants there. And, uh, again, this year, Small Business Saturday will be November 27th. We'll have the same promotion as we did last year. We'll be offering $10 coupons to the public uh, for their use at a local participating restaurant. Those coupons will be available at the visitor center and they're for one day only on the 27th, and it was uh, really well uh, subscribed to last year. There were over 400 coupons that were issued, and it's a great way to get out and maybe uh, try the restaurant that you have not been to in our community. Uh, Valerie Harper and other staff have been involved with our efforts to get a, uh, or to submit a Build Back Better Challenge Grant uh, for $50 million. There have been a lot of people, Mr. Hall and his staff, our staff, Harvest folks, a lot of folks have been involved in this. It's obviously, um, it would be, uh, probably state the obvious say it's a long shot, but there is, uh, there are two phases of this. We hope to, to get at least a planning grant on phase one, which would help us a lot, but it's obviously going to be very competitive and it's on a national basis, but we felt obligated that we should try to, uh, to acquire some of these funds for the community. Um, that division has also completed a business uh, video that we'll show you at, at a later time when there's not so much going on. It's called Small Business, Big Community. It highlights how easy it is for local communities to, to support small businesses and what it means uh, on an average day for those local folks. In our marketing division, we, we have in front of you the August the point report. Again, it's trending in the local election counties of 4.4% below the percent in the last year. So we're excited about uh, the job opportunities that we have uh, in the community. There were five third-party reports this month. Uh, Spencer is also, Spencer Johnson has been involved with the Build Back Better grant. We have submitted, uh, in addition to that, a grant to the VDP for a Virginia Business Ready a sites grant program, we submitted a grant for 2.36 million that will be used at Commonwealth Crossing to help us continue with grading there on lot one. Uh, and also, uh, good news, the EDC uh, was successful in getting funding again uh, for another round from Harvest. Uh, this, uh, this grant is for 54 months. It will run from January of 22 through June of 26. So we're, we're happy about that, obviously. Uh, there's been a lot of information we've been gathering. You can see that Spencer is uh, getting information on racking companies and also steel tank manufacturers for shock. Uh, the shock team will be back in town the uh, week of November the 8th. And the engineering folks, so you're going to start seeing a lot of things happening at the shell building there as they ramp up and hopefully will be fully operational by first quarter of 23. In tourism, there were five registered guests at the visitor center. 
The Dick and Willie had a total of uh, 4,730 folks on it in the last month. Our new activity guide for 22 will be coming out soon. Those, uh, those uh, updates have been completed, and you can see the blogs that have been done for fall funds with Uptown Plus Fridays and for off track funding in advance of the race. Coming up also Foodie Wednesday, the four local restaurants that will that participate in that. That's a big event that we do on social media around race week. We worked a lot with Rooster Walk. Uh, obviously, that was October the 8th to the 10th. Our staff, uh, we, should, we sponsored the shuttle at that event. Our staff also worked the booth on Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, our, our mobile booth. And we've done a lot of video shooting this month. Um, Particularly, we're going to, uh, tourism going to put a new sign, new welcome sign at Philpot Lake. We have over 700,000 people that are on the water there a year, and we want to improve that. All of these items that are listed under there are the things that staff has had to do working with PDOT to get uh, permission to film and do some promotional stuff along the road. We've notified everybody that lives on Green Hill Drive, and they've been very, very cooperative in helping us uh, get this done. Talent development. The bi-weekly meeting with five points uh, was held. There was a virtual event, virtual groundbreaking with five points project. We have also launched a new job board you can see on Martinsville and May on that website. And we've launched our mix uh, Martins and Made industry videos this year. Again, we're not taking teachers into the into the plants, but we are doing the videos. So those are Dacaval, Pardide, Monogram, Virginia Glass, Mirror, and the Career Academy, all really good, um, important things for us to promote. And we've had a video shoot for the fall getaway in March. So I'll be happy to answer other questions. Anyone we'll have any questions with Mark at this time? Thank you. Agenda item number nine, the designation of the voting representative for the 2021 uh, VACO annual meeting, Mr. Hall. The 2021 VACO annual meeting is scheduled for November 14th through the 16th. Each county is asked to designate a member of a selected board and an alternate alternate to vote on the county's behalf on the issue that may arise. If no board members of the board are attending, the board may designate a non-elected official to serve as that voting rep. Uh, Mr. Slaughter and myself are planning to attend that meeting. Okay, uh, with that criteria, and it uh, looks like that we have enough to fill the position and the alternate, what is the pleasure of the board? Mr. Chairman, I move that Tommy Slaughter be our voting representative at the 2021 Virginia Association of Counties annual meeting. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? It is a 6 0, uh, Jennifer. Agenda item number 10 uh, financial matters 10A additional appropriation referencing fresh fruit and vegetable program for the school board, Mr. Hall. School Superintendent Sandy Strayer is asking the board to approve an additional appropriation of $235,061 to the school's nutrition budget for the fresh fruit and vegetable program for the elementary schools. These funds are provided by the Virginia Department of Education from a U.S. Department of Agriculture allocation. Uh, you have a memo from Ms. Strayer in your board packet. I haven't seen it. She, I think she may be here. If you have any questions, you can direct them. Well, Mr. Bill, Dr. Bones. Dr. Bones is here. Uh, with the background material provided, what is the pleasure of the board? Mr. Chairman, I make a recommendation that we approve the $235,061 to the school nutrition budget as requested. Second. second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? It is uh, 6 0, uh, Jennifer. Uh, agenda item number 11 uh, discussion of stipend for certain courthouse staff, Mr. Hall. At your last meeting, Dr. David Martin informed the board of a request by the clerks of the Juvenile and Domestic Relations Court and the General District Court to consider their staff for hazardous duty stipend since they had to work during the pandemic. All of the staff in these courts are employees of the Commonwealth of Virginia and are not under the personnel policies of Henry County. Dr. Martin made a motion and it was seconded to provide a $2,000 stipend to each of the employees in these courts. Ms. Buchanan then made a substitute motion delaying any action on this matter until the board had more time to evaluate the request. The substitute motion received a second and it has passed unanimously. Dr. Martin requested that this item be placed again on the agenda for this month for further discussion. 
Dr. Martin, since uh, you uh, placed this on the agenda, and I know that uh, you provided either uh, through the uh, background material we had last month, are there any additional comments? Well, I guess I'd like to make the motion, see if there's a second, and then provide additional comments, if that's all right with you, Mr. Chairman. There's a motion. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion at this point? Can we read the motion so we get that? Uh, I move that the uh, clerks of the Juvenile Domestic Relations Court and the General District Court receive a stipend, a one-time stipend of $2,000. Okay. All right. We have a motion and a second. Is uh, any discussion? Yes, sir, there is. Yes. Um, as a former educator, I think it's only my uh, duty to compare and contrast the two items on our agenda today requiring extra funding, those of the court system and those of the sheriff's department. Um, I think both issues are equity issues. Uh, there's an equity issue in the sheriff's department and I totally support what they are about. But in the juvenile domestics court and the general district court, there are only 15 employees and who could not work from home, not saying the sheriff's office could not work from home, but um, they are the only employee group that works in this county that generates uh, revenue. Right now, and I was just given an update, uh, they have collected to date $124,373.75. Now, when I passed out um, last week some information, this idea of supplementing or giving bonuses uh, to the General District Court and the Clerks of Juvenile Domestic Relations Court is not a foreign concept in Virginia. In fact, you received a list. There are 23 other districts in Virginia that supplement these employees via a stipend or a percentage, up to 15% uh, of their salary to supplement uh, their salaries pick for jobs uh, that they are currently doing. So I guess the bottom line is, for me, this is an equity issue. Every employee that worked for the benefit of Henry County and its citizenry during the last 18 months for a pandemic um, received a stipend, whether they were employees or they were employees of Henry County. So I was told that because these are state employees, you couldn't hire and fire them, and that's the defining line. But yet there are 23 other districts in the state of Virginia that say, okay, we recognize that, but we also recognize that these employees have gone beyond the call of duty and we need to do something different for them. I've also heard that, well, if we do it for the clerks of Juvenile Domestic Relations Court and General District Court, other state employees will come with their hands out. I don't know that that's true. Um, but I do know that these individuals who worked there during the pandemic were told by the Virginia Supreme Court they could not close, they could not go home, they had to come to work. And thank goodness they did, because we had children taken out of homes, we had domestic violence, and somebody had to deal with those Henry County families. So bottom line, this is an equity issue. And as your, as your neighbor and colleague, uh, we have people that have done their job and, believe it or not, did not receive not even a thank you. Um, but everyone else seemed to, got, seemed to get money. So I'm asking you, when you take this vote, and there are four members of the court here today to watch the vote, um, to do the right thing. And I think this is the right thing. Is there any other discussion? Any discussion? All in favor? 
Opposed? Uh, motion fails uh, two four. Agenda item number 12, consideration of Sheriff's Office request for additional compensation for deputies. Mr. Hall. Last month, Sheriff uh, Perry spoke to the Board of Supervisors to request additional compensation for Sheriff's deputy. The Board directed staff to meet with members of the Sheriff's Office and work on details to move this issue forward. Within your working papers, you have a staff report. And the lion's share of the work on this uh, report in front of you with, came from Mr. Wagner, uh, Mr. Jones, and Ms. Vi. And then I kind of came in at the end and, and uh, kind of slicked it up a little bit or, or whatever I can do to not destroy the, the work that they did. But I think it's a great document to show everyone, public and the board, uh, some background information on uh, our sheriff's office, how it compares in compensation and staffing to other localities. Uh, but the real, uh, I guess the real crux of the matter in front of us today, you'll find on page six, and I'll direct you to that. Um, through our research, through staff work, it is our belief that we can use uh, the American Rescue Plan Act money or ARPA money uh, for hazardous duty supplements to law enforcement. Staff is also recommending that should the board choose to move forward with this plan, we respectfully recommend that public safety also be considered as part of this. Um, the supplement must be based on hours worked and not part of a total compensation package. In other words, this will not go to their retirement, to their bottom line. This will provide funding, uh, additional funding from uh, January 1st, 2022 to June 30th, 2022. And you'll see the chart about halfway down the page on page six. Uh, we show you the impact of, of what uh, we're putting in front of you. Uh, if you choose to do a, a $1 an hour supplement for each uh, deputy or each sheriff office person that is eligible for these ARPA uh, amounts, um, that will have a current fiscal year impact of $209,154. If you do a dollar and a half, you see that number there, uh, about $314,000. If you choose to do a $2 an hour supplement, uh, that will be an impact of $418,000 uh, for the sheriff's office out of the ARPA money for January 1 to June 3rd. Uh, and then you see a number below that. Should you want to extend this compensation, uh, this additional compensation, and make it part of the salary of these offices, that will have to be done for the budget starting July 1. And you see an annual impact of what staff believes will be that annual impact. And you see those numbers in front of me. Um, Sheriff Perry also requested $50,000 in funding to provide signing bonuses for new deputies. Staff believes that uh, with the number of vacancies that the Sheriff's Office currently has, there probably is sufficient money in the current budget to reallocate that money toward one-time bonuses. And uh, we would recommend that if you consider that, that the Sheriff be, uh, be asked to find that within whatever his current budget uh, numbers are. And then below that, uh, under additional considerations, we talked about the public safety uh, aspect of this. Uh, they too have had to do uh, heroic work during this, uh, this period that we find ourselves in, just as the Sheriff's Office personnel has. And uh, we would uh, recommend on a staff basis that if you choose to move forward with the Sheriff's Office, you, always move, you also move forward with public safety. And again, we provide uh, a, a, a graphic uh, an example of the impact is to include public safety in this. Again, on a dollar an hour, dollar and a half an hour, two dollar an hour basis, you'll see that. Again, that will come out of ARPA money, not out of the reserves that we discussed previously. ARPA rules, and we've gotten clarification, we are allowed to use that ARPA money for this hazard duty trouble. <coughs> Again, it's an hourly, what we're recommending is an hourly increase. It does not go to their bottom line, but clearly the idea would be that if you approve it now, come budget time on July 1, there's probably going to be the expectation that you roll that into a salary number, which would go to their bottom line for, um, for uh, retirement purposes. And then at the bottom, we just throw in a future fiscal impact. Um, funding this will have an impact of at least $1.1 million going forward. These costs going forward from July 1 forward. These will not be one-time costs. These will be recurring budgetary costs. So you need to understand that there's a temporary fix from January 1 to June 30. But once we get to July 1, the expectation, I'm sure, will be this money be rolled into their salaries and be funded that way. Um, so uh, that's what we're presenting to put it in perspective. We've all sat through the reversion meetings where, depending on whose account you want to believe, uh, 
city thinks we'll have to raise our real estate rate five cents to mitigate the cost of reversion. Our accountant seems to think that's eight cents, but we all agree that it's going to be substantial. Uh, going forward, and this is not going to mean that we would suggest you do this all on real estate because we're just trying to make it math simple for everybody. But if you want to do this going forward and keep this part of the budget starting July the 1st, uh, that's probably going to necessitate an equivalent of about a 3.9 cent increase on the real estate rate to adjust for that from a budgetary standpoint. So, um, again, I love the staff who put this together. We met with Sheriff uh, Perry, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Eames, Mr. Harrison. We met, uh, had a great meeting. We came to this conclusion that this was an adequate way to move this forward. Uh, with the expectation that come budget time, we're going to have to reconsider whether you want to roll it in. And if you do, then it's the cost of that, obviously. So, uh, the report is there. Um, if you want to ask staff any questions, we'll be glad to answer. I don't want to have any questions of staff. First and foremost, I appreciate you all, both parties, getting together and uh, to sit down and talk about it and to, uh, to see where it carries us, not just for here and now, what it would carry us for the future. Um, Dale, since you did a lot of work on it, uh, any other input on this? You know, I know a lot of the men and women work in the sheriff's office and uh, they do put their lives on the line very often, but I think most of them will agree to you. Uh, Henry County is a good place to work. The sheriff's office is a good place to work. And uh, even though the pay may not be the best, it is a great organization. And like, you know, anyone looking for a law enforcement career, they're, they're a, an optimal place to go, and that's Henry County. Uh, Sheriff Perry does a good job running a, a good operation there, and this board has always been very supportive of the sheriff's office. So I don't want anything that's came out over the last couple of months to discourage people from wanting to apply there. It really is a good organization to work with. Other okay. questions or comments or something that needs uh, a clearing up in any form? All right, now the sheriff is here. Let's see. Sheriff Perry, do you have any comments? Um, just thank you for the uh, work on this. I do thank the administration. We did have a very good meeting. And uh, I think they will send some very good comments. The men and women are very proud of work and serve their community. Uh, through communications, a little latitude that we now have, I will say we've had one that has come back. Uh, there's some communications with another one. You know, um, Men and women, right now through this time frame, they do have a very arduous task. Uh, they do regularly run into life-threatening situations, and they've overcome them. I, I think great dedication through COVID, and you've never let the services suffer for the citizens. And the request was based on behalf of the citizens. Uh, we have a good community. Um, we, despite sometimes how a uniform crime report can look, but I think we have a low rate of violence. Generally, the violence is usually linked to high-risk behaviors and things like that, so our citizens can enjoy this community. I thank you for your support. I do stand behind my men and women, and they will be appreciative of whatever. Uh, they're also appreciative of just the recognition because they do a job for the community that is extremely important. And if it ever gets a foothold slacking backwards, it will change our community. And, and I'll answer any questions that have. So you feel it was a good meeting? Okay. Yes, yes, yes. We're very thankful, Mr. Mr. Chairman. If I could, please. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I uh, contacted both the sheriff's department and the county admin immediately after your meeting that you had, and both you and and the administration both told me that the meeting went very well. Last month, uh, when the request was made. Um, we was not as a position as a county to make a recommendation whether we was going to support the 10 percent across the board raise and the one time five thousand dollar sign on bonus but i don't believe that you heard any one of the supervisors here say that they would not take that in consideration and work us out you know the some of the suggestions that i made last month was some of the suggestions that you used uh to make this where it is right now um, to the service department I would think that you would look at this board right here and say these six supervisors on this board has every one of you 
in our thoughts and our prayers at nighttime when we go to bed, pray for our safety of our, command, our, our county and our community. Everyone knows the difficulties that you go through. Even though we're not working in your boots and we don't walk your walk, we could see, read, and hear about the difficulties that you go through as deputies, not only deputies, but public safety. The public safety is out there every day dealing with this COVID that's going through. Nobody wanted to see this COVID come on. Nobody wanted to see this mess come on here in Henry County or any place else that we want this to come on. But sometimes there comes tough decisions that's got to be made. Last month was one of the areas that was brought to our attention that we could not make a decision rapidly without discussion of it. Thank goodness that you sat down and you had a understandable communications with the county and the county had understandable communications with the sheriff's department and he was able to work what we have in front of us today. Uh, I do believe that this is a start and we can work to get both sides somewhere satisfied uh, on the remedies that you brought up to us last month. Others? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to know from the county of uh, the administration, what is their specific recommendation regarding this report? Um, we're choosing not to give you a direct dollar amount. We're laying out what that possibility, what those possibilities would be. This is a policy decision. Um, so we're recommending that if you choose to move forward, that it come out of our fund, which is allowable expense, does not impact our fund balance, uh, which is good. And we also recommend that if you choose to move forward, we, we also include public safety because they have many of the same issues. So, so, so I think what I'm hearing you say, too, is to uh, use that ARPA money and then uh, when the new year rolls around in, in budget time, then consider how we can move forward with um, a pay raise for well, I, deputies. We'll have to have the discussion at that point that if you want to roll this into a, a bottom line pay raise, which benefits okay. retirement, all that stuff, which they clearly could use, right. uh, there has to be a genuine discussion at that point that you guys will have to know this goes into the budget it's a recurring expense mm -hmm. how do you best want us to attach or to approach that um, the, the six months from january 1 to june 30 arpa money one-time money um, that's not our money to not coming out of county coffers it's clearly our money but uh, going forward you just have to be aware that we need to have this discussion for an ongoing escalation of compensation as we get into the budget but have said that this money will work up until that budget time comes. Yeah, the way we've laid, laid it out in this report is that it will start January 1, which is what the sheriff asked for last month, go from January 1 to June 30, hourly increase of the amount that you choose, uh, just with the awareness that going forward July 1, this will be part of the budget and it will be an ongoing issue. Right. Okay, does the board have sufficient explanation of this? I've, to, to I've just got a little bit to chime in on. I actually had a chance to do a ride along on Saturday with uh, Corporal Panos and A Patrol, and it was it was pretty eye opening. I mean, I got to see a lot. There was actually a shooting that night at Economy Lodge across from Enterprise in Collinsville, and just just the number of calls we went on and the camaraderie among everybody on A Patrol was outstanding, and it brought back fond memories of myself in the military. But I mean. What they go through is, it's easy to sit here and think about it, but until you actually experience it, you don't really know. Uh, I'm totally in favor of using the $2 out of ARPA for hourly pay increase to get us through the next budget year. But the most important thing is to figure out when it comes time to plan next year's budget, how we're gonna incorporate steps into their pay scale so they get something moving forward every year. Uh, similar to teacher steps, I guess, but something as far as the deputies go. Like, you take a corporal that gets promoted to a sergeant, and I think they get like a $1,200 bump in pay, which is not very much when you look at the responsibility between a sergeant and a corporal. And then I think it's the same from a sergeant to a lieutenant. It's like a $1,200 bump in pay. So that's something for us to look at and work with the sheriff's office on come February or end of January when we start planning next year's budget, how we can incorporate this and make it more beneficial to them to show our appreciation to the sheriff's office moving forward. But uh, I appreciate the opportunity to do a ride along and I might actually go again when I get the nerve up and need a little excitement one night. And I do thank you for that. Thank you for your input and, and we'll just say very briefly, um, having born and raised here as many of us here, 
uh, but I have what I believe in our community and where we stand, even though everywhere has some problems and there's certainly the drug problems, but in the day and age we live in the quality of services that go on by the sheriff's office, I believe in men and women in all of our public safety. And it's also, but our risk factors are increasing because we now live in a day and age where it's easier for people to be under the influence and the shooting that you actually were able to witness. We are having more of these incidents. We're having more home invasion robberies. Now I go back once again, they're usually related to drugs. But once again, we are the safety for our community and we don't want citizens losing the quality of life and we want to keep people that we can stay on top of these problems. Uh, the home invasion robbery, one of the investigators is back here in the corner and I think four out of the six people have already had warrants issued on them. Our men and women do a tremendous job that despite things that we don't agree with and the risk factors to our community, but they do serve our community well to keep our citizens safe. <coughs> Uh, I guess. Go ahead. I, the first thing I need to do is, is apologize, and I wish the room was full of all of you like it was the last time. I, when I said something about dedication, I was not questioning every one of you's dedication. I've been in your shoes for 25 years. I've walked to walk and talked to talk. And I know, and what I was trying to say is, this is not a job you're going to get rich in. You've got to have the dedication to it in order to be out there every day beating the bushes and, and doing whatever you've got to do. And I, I appreciate that because, like I say, I know where you're coming from. I don't need to ride along with you because I have rode that car for 25 years. So, and, and I'm very proud of the Sheriff's Department. As a matter of fact, last week I was in Pigeon Forge. I went to Cracker Barrel. The young lady that waited on our table I said, well, young lady, anyway, her husband is a resource officer out there in Pigeon Forge, but he's very upset from talking to her about the way things are changing out there and that he's looking to make a move. She was born in Virginia. She wants to come back to Virginia, and he wants a, a country setting to, to live in. They don't like the way Pigeon Forge is building up. She come back to get the plates off our table. She said, my husband said, I thank you. He's already online with Henry County checking to see what's going on. I said, well, I know we've got to hire a lot of, a lot of deputies because we're fixing to open up a jail. And, and so, uh, you know, I, like I say, I, I hate it. I didn't appreciate some of the comments I heard said as some of you were going out. But, you know, if that was my fault, then then I want to be the, the first one to apologize for it. So, but, uh, you know, I, 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 I've been there, and, and I know, and I know that I used to be the one right up front. I mean, I've caught the mayor several times coming out of council meetings and went out in the parking lot talking to him because I always harped on salaries and stuff, but, uh, but it never was. The one good thing I like about this is we're talking dollar amounts. That means that Steve Eanes is going to get the same raise that the guy that went to work yesterday got. Uh, that's what I don't like about percentage raises. The guy that's making big monies, he just keeps on climbing and it keeps on separating. So, you know, I, uh, we finally got to that in the city. When I first went to work for the city, we were getting 10 cent an hour, 25 cent an hour, that kind of thing. But then they started getting on this. It was easier for them to, to do. I think they, they started getting on these percentage raises. And then they worked it out to where it fell within the steps that they had. Uh, sometimes if they voted on a 5% raise, you've got a, a 4.2 and somebody else got a 5.3. Uh, so uh, that, didn't, that didn't set well with me either. So I'm glad to see that, that we're talking dollar amounts because the guy that just went to work, loaf of bread, shoes for his kids cost just as much as, as the colonels or the sheriff or anybody else's. So I, I, I like to see that. And I hope this thing and, and then in July when we work it in, we're gonna look at dollar amounts and not percentages so that you know, we can get the start and pay up to where we think it ought to be anyway. 
Mr. Yes. Chairman, are you looking for a motion? Uh, briefly, I'd like uh, uh, a short comment from Matt Tatum since he's here in regard to uh, public safety. Yep. <coughs> Uh, first of all, on behalf of public safety, thank you for the consideration. Uh, the men and women of the Department of Public Safety has already been said is uh, continue to respond to the emergencies during this time. We have had uh, a higher than normal turnover rate, uh, and many of them have shared that the, the compensation of the jurisdictions is the reason. Uh, many of them are also just exhausted because of uh, COVID, uh, and it's not only affected uh, the first responders, but I mean, look at your hospitals. Uh, I mean, they are offering insane amounts of money uh, to get people just to work, and uh, it's just people are exhausted. So, the any consideration uh, given for the uh, public safety staff is very much appreciated, and you guys and ma'am always support us, and we very much appreciate that. With that, Dr. Morton, if you're prepared to make a motion. And I may need some help from an administration. Uh, I move that we approve a two-hour supplement to- Two dollars an hour? Two dollars an hour. So make them work two more hours? I don't think- No, 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 no. Two dollars an hour supplement um, uh, for both the Sheriff's Office and Public Safety. And that we allow the Sheriff to have a $50,000 uh, signing bonus. Is that taken out of his current budget? $5,000. It says 50, 50 here. $50,000 for 10 $5,000 signing bonus. The report says that we, staff believes that with the vacancies that they currently have, they can use that money that's already in their budget. Okay. To then, use that for signing bonus. Then the motion is just for the $2 an hour ARPA, supplement. ARPA money. Okay. Use of ARPA. ARPA. Correct. Okay, we have a motion of $2 an hour to include both Sheriff Department employees and public safety employees. Is there a second? Second. second. We have multiple seconds. Any discussion at this point? All in favor? It's 6 0, uh, Jennifer. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen of both public safety and the Sheriff's Department, for all that you did. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Agenda item uh, number 13, uh, we'll have an update on reversion. Uh, this will be uh, taken by County Attorney uh, George Lyle and uh, our Attorney Jeremy Carroll. Uh, who wants to lead into this? I will. All right, thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the Board of Supervisors. I just wanted to give you a brief update on uh, the status of reversion. As you are aware, the Commission on Local Government issued a comprehensive report on October 15th, following up on the city's proposed reversion and the voluntary settlement agreement that was negotiated between the parties uh, in, in the mediation, and also following up on the oral presentations and public hearings that the Commission referred to in the of September. Thank you, sir. The Commission began its presentation by recounting the history of the proceedings beginning with the September 2020 filing by the City, following up through the November 2020 filing by the County in response, through the mediation process, and then through the uh, oral presentation of the public hearing. The Committee then proceeded to discuss in the scope of its review it indicated that its review based on the controlling statutes was focused on the best interests of the Commonwealth, which entailed consideration of the best interests of Henry County and uh, the city of Martinsville. They noted, however, that there was no legal analysis in their presentation uh, and their report. Uh, we do remain confident, however, on behalf of the county, and I know the city does as well, that the process uh, employed by the city and county and the voluntary settlement agreement that was negotiated uh, is, uh, is valid and legal. I know there have been some questions about that in the community. Uh, they then reviewed the characteristics of the city and the county, and I won't get into the details. They studied issues such as uh, age and, and um, declining population demographics, income, unemployment. The gist at the end of the day was that both communities are facing economic, social, and fiscal challenges. 
they did conclude that the city was facing uh, slightly more problems in those areas. They, interesting quote, they said that the county's problems were not quite at the same magnitude or severity as the city. Proceeding then through the remainder of the report, they did conduct their review on whether the re reversion as proposed in the voluntary settlement agreement was in the best interest of the city, county, and commonwealth. They did conclude that it was. I would also uh, point out that they specifically noted that the exchange of the annexation moratorium for 10 years uh, in consideration for the adjustments made to sort of revenue sharing agreements was reasonable. They found that specifically to be a reasonable uh, agreement between the parties. Um, I would say based on a fair reading of the report to that point, it was quite clear that the commission viewed the city's fiscal condition as warranting reversion. There's been discussion again in the community about whether reversion uh, would have happened should, it, should it, there have been more resistance to it. I think a fair reading demonstrates that whatever the outcome at the end of the day would have been, reversion would have happened um, based on the commission's report. The commission made a recommendation that the special court, and I will get into the process in just one second from here on out, that the special court approve the voluntary settlement agreement as is. They did not suggest any specific revisions to the voluntary settlement agreement. Uh, that's important because they did make some recommendations for the parties to consider, but they did not require that those be implemented or, uh, or incorporated into the voluntary settlement agreement before we, we proceed to the next uh, level of review. One of those uh, proposed recommendations had to do with early childhood education. They encouraged the county and the city to become a town to study and implement broader early childhood education. They also encouraged, and one of the proposals in there was the consideration of possibly conveying Clearview Elementary to the county. Uh, another possibility they considered was that the town could continue to offer early childhood education within the town if it so elected to do so without actually having a school division. They also encouraged increased transparency in the process. Um, obviously the county is not the, the engine driving reversion, so a, a lot of the transparency issues seem to deal with the process that led to reversion. Needless to say, once we got into litigation and discussions between the city and county, we were as transparent as we could be, but there just certainly were some issues that had to be addressed in a closed meeting. Uh, of course, the county will continue to be transparent going forward. Uh, a third issue they raised was the possibility of increasing the number of election districts in the city from one, as stated in the voluntary settlement agreement, to two election districts. Interestingly, they said, do so to the extent, words to the effect of consistent with state and federal law. Well, I, I found that a little bit surprising because to the extent uh, there was any implication in the commission's recommendation that Henry County voters would be diluted for the benefit of town voters, that clearly would violate state and federal law. So you, you can't just increase the number of election districts in the city, again, or the town, unless you increase the size of the board. So that, that is obviously a policy decision for this board. The Voluntary Settlement Agreement makes it clear that the number and orientation, other than the one, division, one district in the city, of election districts will be up to this body. Uh, and the final recommendation from the commission had to do with the effective date. And of course, as ladies and gentlemen know, the effective date was the, the real crux of the matter as we went through the oral presentations. The town or the, the city had proposed July 1, 22 as the effective date. We had proposed July 1, 2024 as the effective date. The, uh, the commission seems to have struck a compromise between those two positions and encouraged the parties to accept July 1, 2023 as the effective date for reversion. They did note and that date is contingent on there not being any unusual or unexpected delays in the process from here on out. So with regard to that process from here on out, um, the parties, the city and the county, must decide if they're going to amend the voluntary settlement agreement based on those recommendations from the commission, those, those few recommendations. Again, there is no obligation to do so. We will then proceed with an ordinance to adopt the voluntary settlement agreement, either in its original form or in its amended form. 
and we will petition the circuit court, the Henry County Circuit Court, to notify the Virginia Supreme Court of the process. The Virginia Supreme Court will then appoint a three-judge panel to evaluate the voluntary settlement agreement and make an assessment of whether it is in the best interest of the Commonwealth, which again would entail consideration of the best interest of the county and the city. Um, and with that, that is, that is a summation, a brief summation of what has transpired over the last few weeks and where we are and where we're going. I, I would say, based on the Commission's report, the expectation is that reversion uh, will occur on July 1, 2023, and we should plan accordingly. I'm happy to answer any questions anyone may have. What happens if this board does not approve the ordinance? either in its original form or as amended? Because there will be a vote, as you said. There will be a vote on the ordinance. After a public hearing, is that right? I would have to double check the code to make sure of that. I believe there's a requirement for a public hearing. Correct, so there's a public hearing and then there's another vote. Yeah, there is certainly a vote on the ordinance. And honestly, that could go in a number of different directions. If it were rejected, there would undoubtedly be a fallback to the normal course of the litigation and the, what I mean by that is then we're back to the city seeking to revert we lose the benefit of the negotiated which the Commission deemed reasonable annexation moratorium in exchange for the bond uh, for the uh, adjustments to the revenue sharing agreements uh, and then you end up with the expense associated with the litigation and like I mentioned earlier I anticipate the outcome to be the same at the end of the day, that reversion will happen. It's just a matter of getting there, the pain of getting there, the expense of getting there, and what does it look like at the end of the day. Uh, that, that would be up in the air. There's, there, there's one other caveat to this. You know, we have an agreement, the voluntary settlement agreement, and there could be an effort to compel the county through alternative litigation to, uh, to adhere to the terms of the agreement. But that's... And would the city bring that suit? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, so the city would be proceeding in, in one course or the other in that, in that eventuality. So, so to put it in layman's terms, if we voted against it, reversion's still going to happen. I think Correct. in layman's terms, yes, unless the city There's nothing, changes its Nothing mind. can stop reversion except for the city voting not to revert. Right. I think Correct. that's correct. Yes, Mr. Zinn. Whether we vote for it or not. Yes. The terms, the expense would change. It would just cost us more money. Exactly. Mr. Lyle, do you uh, have uh, additional uh, information of, uh, for the public's benefit or for the board's benefit? I got, I got one more thing. So, so say we scrapped it. It still goes to the three-judge panel. There's no agreement. The three-judge panel could then say, well, there's no agreement, so we're going to give you the city's debt, which we're not getting now, per the settlement agreement, and they can annex after two years instead of ten. It would all be in the hands of the three-judge panel, and there would be nothing we could do about it if it was voted down. I, I think it would actually back up a stage and have to go through the commission on local government again. How okay. Our posture currently is that we have a voluntary settlement agreement to present to the three-judge panel. If for some reason that were not adopted, I think you go back to the commission. I think Martinsville goes back to its initial notice and the ask in that notice, and then we'll litigate from that step forward. We would have another hearing with the commission and then a three-judge panel. Right. So they would take a little bit longer than just our, our current posture, but again, I, I do believe the outcome would, would be the same. So once the public hearing occurs, correct? Correct. When is the vote taken? At, that night? That Immediately thereafter. That night. And we haven't scheduled that date yet. We, we have not. There, there are some schedules of concern that you have to advertise twice, once a week apart, so it can't be like too too soon. So for the county, but it could be at the next monthly meeting. Right. It, for the county, it could be over that night, if this count, if this board does not vote for it, and then we go back to the commission, as you said. That's right. Okay. And, I, and I think Mr. Carroll's points were really well taken. The, the commission on local government was unanimous that this that reversion of Martinsville to a town is in the best interest of the Commonwealth, in the best interest of this community. I, I mean, they just, I think they were very clear in what they said in that, and they thought that the agreement we reached was reasonable. Um, and, and I know many people in this community disagree with that. Many people don't think Martinsville should become a town. 
and I think Mr. Zare's comments are, are right on point, those concerns should be taken to Marfil City Council because they meet the legal requirements for a work to a town. Correct. And it's just a matter of how that will work. And, I, and, and this board's previous votes on this settlement agreement have, I, I think, were wise because we got something out of it in holding off annexation because once they're a town, they can start expanding their border to becoming a bigger town in our county. Uh, they have the legal right to do that uh, two years after they were birthed, and we negotiated a longer term because of the negative financial impact that would have. So, uh, you know, I, I think that that's that's why we, we, you know, why the board voted in May and then again in August to support the voluntary settlement agreement. It's not something we want, uh, but it's going to happen uh, <coughs> undoubtedly unless Martinsville votes to change their course of action. And this is probably the best result we can get out of it as far as the financial security of our citizens and the local government going forward. What happens if the vote from this board is 3-3? It would fail. We have no tiebreaker. 3-3 three, three votes uh, do not pass. Because we no longer have a tiebreaker in the county. Co correct. That was okay. several years ago. Question, right? So the question is, <clears throat> after the 10-year moratorium passes and annexation becomes in the play possibility and the city starts annex approximately 10 miles outside the radius of the city which would be the town is there considered that the county would do legal action to stop this i would i mean i would recommend um you have to take the facts as they occur at the time it happens but anytime a town in this county would try to annex I would sit down with the elected body at that time and discuss the pros of resisting it, cooperating with it, and seeing what they are. Um, because almost inevitably there will be, it, it just depends on the facts, well, why would they, they want to do it, what they're proposing, how much, and what, what we would lose in it. But For example, Mr. Bryant, what, some of the factors for an annexation proceeding are the need for urban services in the areas to be annexed. Well, the areas around Martinsville are not in need of urban services because they're by and large already being provided. Another factor is the need for revenue. That is a legitimate consideration in an annexation proceeding. But with the adjustments that have been made to revenue sharing agreements, we've addressed the cities or the towns need for revenue. So it is far from certain in our perspective that, that Martinsville would be able to annex um, in 10 years. I guess or, I should have said we'll, we'll be better positioned. I would say as we sit here today, in 10 years, we will be better positioned um, to fight and resist an annexation than we will be in two years from today. Because they'll have had 10 years to live as a town within their budget, and, and we presumably during that time will have grown and increased our urban services that we already provide to our community, and, and we'll be sharing revenue with them. We'll just be better positioned to, to resist annexation in 10 years than we would be in two years because their financial position might largely be very similar than it is today, minus the expenses of the things they have to run. But they, they wouldn't have the benefit of that extra revenue that we're going to share with them. So we'll be better positioned to resist it in 10 years, almost undoubtedly. But you have to say that with a caveat, because it's all dependent on the economy. I mean, the world changes rapidly on us. And our economy is doing well here, I would say, locally. In many ways, we've had a lot of good announcements. but. What if the federal government did something that took all our industry away again? I mean, we, we, the whole world would look different. Continu continued growth in the industrial parts that will help provide yeah. the revenue that, that would otherwise be satisfied through annexation. I was just thinking hypothetically, it's 10 years from now, and chances are maybe none of us will be on the board at that time. But if we have a representative from the city acting as a new board of supervisor, <clears throat> excuse me, and then we're trying to <clears throat> talk about uh, annexation. How do you deal legally with that when you have someone in the room and you're trying to strategically talk about annexation and, and, and how to how to address that? Well, well, remember, I, I know how you refer to them. They, they will be representing the county citizens who live, who live in the, the town. town. Right. Yeah. So, so I mean, they have a unique role. That, 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 <laughs> their that, their yeah. duties would be to to this board and to the county because that is who elected them. They right. would not be appointed by the city. But I do understand. I do understand your point. Yeah. 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 You're, sure. you're, I understand your point. They'd be yeah. fully representing a town that wants to expand its borders and. That would, yeah. so, something we can take up with other communities who have confronted similar situations and see how they address it. 
Right. You know, and, and the reason I brought this up is because I can see in 10 years from now, just as Ms. Buchanan just said, uh, I'm thinking that probably, probably none of us here will be on the board in 10 years. Uh, I can see somebody else sitting in my position here that's going to be thinking, here comes the legal part of what we talked about some 10 years ago. How are we going to work this legal out now when we could have took care of it now? Uh, it, it is in my mind, but having talked to some of the members of the city council in the past, they tell me that it's not all about reversing as much as it is about the footprint. They, they are land-based where they can't expand out uh, to bigger industries and so forth because they're landlocked in the city. So they need to try to work outside the city limits, the town limits would be, to gain more land mask to be able to expand the town's limits. Uh, I think that's driven by revenue. Yeah. I think the reason well, that I think I think I think, I think 100 percent that it's driven by revenue. revenue. Share, and, and the idea is the revenue sharing agreements plus the savings uh, address the savings. Uh, address those needs. Yeah, plus the savings for not having schools and constitution. Well, I, I think the word footprint is just a nicer word for annexation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, this this is this is it. Mr. Hall, do you have anything uh, in regard to the update on reversion? Uh, no, I just think the board needs to decide when it wants to hold this meeting, uh, whether it's at the November board meeting, uh, which is certainly doable, whether you want to do it prior to that as a special meeting, that's just up to the board. Uh, but we need to start that process to, to move to the next square on the checkerboard. Well, because it is going to be a public hearing, then we would move it to the 6 o'clock time? It would be at 6 o'clock. So the public could participate? I so move. Second. We have a motion or second, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm getting distracted by somebody's cell phone. So, so the motion is? The motion is to hold a public hearing on uh, this reversion ordinance on November the, oh gosh. It should be our November board meeting. At November 6 board meeting at November 6 p.m. November board meeting. Does that work well with staff? date would be November the 23rd. Well, the staff can make happen whatever works for the board. Okay. So November 23rd, 6 p.m. is the motion to hold a public hearing in regard to this. In this room? In this room. Okay. Is, and there was a second. Any discussion? All in favor? It's 6-0, Jennifer. Uh, thank you, uh, George and uh, Jeremy. I appreciate it. Agenda item number 14, a consideration of 2022 legislative agenda uh, for the uh, Virginia General Assembly. Uh, Mr. Hall. Each year, staff and the Board of Supervisors construct a legislative agenda of items we would like for the General Assembly to consider. It is up to the Board of Supervisors to approve the final list for submission to our General Assembly delegates. In the past, we have sent the legislative agenda via email to our state reps or presented it in person during a roundtable discussion of these issues, clearly given our pandemic uh, requirements, uh, uh, dissemination of it probably be through email. Uh, but you have attached uh, a draft legislative agenda. We've also included the proposed VACO uh, legislative agenda. I actually serve on that committee and uh, coming out of the meeting, uh, the annual meeting in, in November, uh, they will have an official legislative agenda approved at that meeting, so I'll be part of that process as well. Uh, the draft legislative agenda from Hen for Henry County uh, was a, a collaborative effort among staff members, department heads, uh, sheriff's office, elected officials, uh, constitutional officers. Um, it's really extremely similar to what you've approved in the past with the exception of the first section, which is re reversion specific. And uh, you can read those, but we are making several requests for one-time funding to do capital expansion, expansions or uh, capital procedures. And we're also asking for a whole harmless provision within there. And we're also asking for consideration for 15 years that the joint uh, community and the single school system would uh, benefit from the uh, better composite index, the one that would get us more state funding. And we're asking for that to be uh, for 15%, uh, 15 years, I'm sorry. Uh, so really the, the, the Changes of substance are right at the top of the document. The rest of it is just uh, essentially what we've done in the past, the tweaks and dates and, and places here and there. So 
Um, staff can certainly answer any questions. If the board chooses uh, to strike a, an item or want to add something, then we will create that, and then that's what uh, we would ask for a motion to approve that with any changes that you want to make, and then we will disseminate this to our representatives as well as um, the folks who lobby on our behalf in the General Assembly, and there is there will be a joint lobbying effort for the specific reversion items that we come up with, because uh, that's part of the, the uh, voluntary settlement agreement that we would work in conjunction with the city to uh, work together to uh, advocate for those changes at the General Assembly. Okay, uh, I know this was 20-some pages uh, uh, as part of the board's uh, background material, uh, along with the explanation of Mr. Hall. Uh, and we do have one other uh, group in the area, the West Piedmont Planning District uh, Commission as well, will uh, submit on behalf of any of the localities uh, legislative uh, agendas as well. Are there any items that uh, need additional consideration uh, to add to this legislative agenda? No, I think Mr. Hall summed it up with reversion and that being separate. Okay. With that, I'll accept the motion that we uh, adopt the uh, 2022 legislative agenda uh, and uh, forward it to the members of the Virginia General Assembly. So moved. Second. second. Have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? It is 6 0, uh, Jennifer. Agenda item 15, uh, informational items. We'll start uh, taking comments from the board, uh, starting with uh, Mr. Zayer. No, sir. Dr. Mark. No, sir. Mr. Bryant. No, sir. Ms. Buchanan. No, I just want to remind people, and uh, of course, the media has been very generous in promoting the fact that we the coat drive has started for the children, and uh, if anyone has new coats or used coats that they would like to uh, donate just please let me know or if they need dry cleaning you take them by the uh, one hour martinizing at any location right. Great. thank you mr slaughter yes <clears throat> mr hall uh, i have several things and i'll get the, uh, the quick ones out of the way first just to remind you of some dates um we have a couple of holidays coming up uh, it's mandated by the state we follow the state holiday survey tuesday november 2nd which is election day that'll be a holiday Tuesday, November the 11th, which is Veterans Day, that's also a holiday. And I'll remind you of the Veterans Day event that we traditionally have. Uh, it'll be 11-11, uh, November the 11th, at 11 a.m. at the uh, J.D. Bassett Event Center, the former Bassett High School. Uh, so I would highly encourage folks to attend that um, if you're around and capable of doing that. Uh, reminder that your December meeting uh, you acted last month and moved that to December the 13th. So just to remind you to make sure you make that change on your calendar. Um, tomorrow, there'll be an event for the uh, Mayo River State Park, the newest state park that's uh, been approved. Uh, there'll be a groundbreaking for that uh, at 11 o'clock. And I, I have given you a map with the directions. Um, it's a lot easier to read the map on how to get there than if I try to tell you how to get there, because you may never get there. I try to tell you. So that's at 11 o'clock. Um, race weekend. Always a huge event here, has a significantly large impact on their economy. Um, ticket sales are well above what they have been. Uh, Mr. Campbell's told me that they're comparing it to 2019, which will be pre-COVID. But uh, even with that comparison, ticket sales are extremely robust. They expect a large crowd for this race. Uh, and we got three, three races in, in two days. Uh, Saturday at one o'clock is the truck race. Saturday night at 6 o'clock is the Xfinity race, and then Sunday at 2 p.m. is the Cup race. So busy, busy weekend for us. A busy weekend for sheriffs, deputies, and public safety because they work all of those events and do them extremely well. So um, we ask also that you be kind to visitors when they come into town. This is a huge event, and you would be surprised how much feedback we get from a positive interaction with a fan, a fan and a local resident. We have anecdotally heard those uh, probably in double figures every time we have a race. People reach out either to the Speedway or to the county or to the chamber or somebody and say, so-and-so, I met so-and-so at, a, at a, a gas station and they were so nice to me. What a great place you guys have. And we need to make sure that we keep that uh, well-earned reputation as we move forward. Um, and then finally, last month, uh, there was a discussion uh, from uh, some fire department representatives, Todd Norman, uh, came to you with a, a list of uh, 
concerns that, that the fire departments have. Um, and I've asked Matt Tatum to address you uh, as briefly as he can today. But uh, Matt has, uh, has reached out to Mr. Norman and his group. And I think Matt can provide you with some details on where we hope to make this uh, move forward. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Paul. Um, when uh, Mr. Norman brought that uh, presentation to you guys, uh, I'll be honest with you, it was the first I'd seen it. Uh, so I was not aware of it. So after that, I have made multiple attempts to get in touch with Chief Norman. I uh, finally have spoken with him uh, due to his schedule. We have not been able to meet face to face of a, as of yet. However, we are planning to do so as soon as his schedule allows. He works in taxes, and apparently there was a tax extension or something that caused a, a big delay. Um, but I just want to let you know uh, the Department of Public Safety has been working to replace the volunteer air packs for several years with some success. Uh, initially, we've done AFG grants. Uh, as we've done a regional approach, we actually included the city in this working together, done a regional approach with all volunteer fire departments, public safety, and the city. Uh, done that for several years and it was unsuccessful, so we tried a different attack and let each department apply on their own. In doing so, uh, four of the fire departments have been successful getting the AFG. Four of the eight volunteer fire departments have been successful. Some of those departments, we did assist them with the grants. Uh, the Department of Public Safety elected last year to delay remounting one of our ambulances to save funds in order to address the, the air pack need for the Department of Public Safety. Uh, of the remaining four volunteer fire departments that have not gotten the AFG grants, one this past year wrote their own AFG proposal. Uh, two uh, has not been successful, however we have and continue to work with them on uh, trying to get them AFG funding, and one has not participated in the AFG process as of yet. Um, so that, that's to uh, address the air packs. We will continue to work with uh, Chief Norman uh, on that. And uh, I will admit I was not aware of the turnout gear concern that they brought to your attention. Um, <coughs> the 10-year recommendation that an FPA has for turnout gear, we don't even follow that for our career staff. Uh, Virginia even elected to stop following that because um, it, they went back to a, a more of approach as you inspect the gear. If the gear doesn't have any obvious tears or uh, contamination that can't be washed out or something like that, you can continue to use it. So uh, we don't use the 10-year rule, so I was not aware that they were using that as a consideration. That is a, a recommendation of an FPA that it be replaced 10 years, but however, it is a recommendation, not a requirement. Uh, again, I continue to meet with, uh, I seek to meet with Chief Norman. Our uh, plan is to meet face-to-face -face prior to meeting with ESAC. I have called a special meeting for ESAC for November the 10th uh, to address this very topic. Uh, with the hopes that we can have you a recommendation back uh, by the November regular meeting. Uh, therefore, if you want to consider it towards ARPA funding or if it is eligible for ARPA funding, uh, you can do so at that time. Uh, if we're not able to do so, then we will certainly uh, consider pursuing this and we will already have the data for uh, budget, FY, the upcoming budget consideration. Uh, so that's where we stand with that. We are working with them. Uh, and it will be vetted through ESAC for a uh, complete recommendation before it comes back. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Two things. Um, on November 11th, the Veterans Day celebration, I would ask county staff to reach out to the public information officer okay. to uh, just let everyone within the county staff know about that. We mentioned it this morning at our staff meeting. Okay. And you mentioned December the 13th. It's I the actually 14th. Actually, the meeting's on the 14th. 14th? Okay. 14th. I'm always ahead of my time. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other informational items? No, sir. Uh, with that, uh, agenda item 16, I'll uh, entertain a motion to go into closed meeting. If someone will cite the items uh, as allowed by the Code of Virginia. Mr. Chairman, I move the board convening to close meeting as permitted under the following sections of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act 
2.237 11A1 for discussion of appointees to the Southern Area Agency on Aging Board, Patriot Center slash CCBC Advisory Board and West Piedmont Planning District Commission, 2.237 11A7 for discussion of pending legal matters, 2.237 11A3 for discussion of acquisition disposal real estate, 2.237 11A5 for discussion of as yet unannounced industry, and 2.237 11A10 for discussion of special awards. Second. Have a I'll motion and a second. Are, are we able to, uh, to add to that uh, the appointees to the Blue Ridge Library Board? Is it, are we eligible for that? I mean, is we are with the, in my district. Yeah, we can add it. Okay. Just add it to the motion. Just say it's the yes. I'd like to add that to the motion. Okay. Add to the motion is a consideration of appointing to the Blue Ridge uh, Regional Library Board. Okay. Have a motion and a second. All in favor? It is uh, 6 0. See board members upstairs in five minutes. Closed session on a motion by Ms. Buchanan, second by Mr. Slaughter. Uh, Mr. Wagner, will you poll the board, please? Do you certify that in closed session we discussed only public business matters, lawfully intended? Yes, sir. 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 Are there any items, uh, Mr. Hall, that you have for the board uh, uh, before we go into recess prior to our 6 p.m. session? No. Board members, do you have any items? Yes, sir. We will stand in recess and uh, start the uh, evening session at 6 p.m. the 6 p.m. session of the October 26, 2021 meeting back to order from our recess from our 3 p.m. session. I'd like to welcome all visitors, remind you, if you want to be placed specifically on an uh, agenda, you'll need to contact the board of boards. Uh, it, well, let me just start again. I'm reading it. If you want to address the board, you need to sign up seven days in advance and contact the county administrator who will schedule you on the board's agenda. That's what I was trying to get out. Um, however, uh, we do have an agenda item tonight, matters presented by the public that anyone is allowed to uh, address the board. Again, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming out and participating in uh, your county government. Uh, our first <coughs> item tonight uh, is agenda item 17, general highway matters. We have with us Lisa Hughes from VDOT. Lisa, welcome. <coughs> I uh, have just a, a few items that, that I can cover. Um, there's a bridge on J.S. Holland Road uh, that, that had been under construction, and we, we finished it today. The road's back open three days early. So uh, mm. also, I, I don't think I have uh, updated you all on the Virginia Avenue project. You know, we uh, uh, it was out for bid <coughs> twice. The bids came back high both times, so we rejected those bids twice. Uh, we have a, a state force contractor that uh, has agreed to do the work. Um, however, he uh, probably won't be able to start till the end of November, and we'll have to, to see how the weather is then. But but we think with a combination of our signal crews and uh, and him with his concrete crews that we can get the sidewalk done and the pedestrian signals in hopefully by the by late spring of next year. Uh, the emergency slide repairs that we've been working on for quite a while on Doug Mountain Road, they should be complete the early part of November. And uh, Woody Circle, that's a, that's a new project, uh, will be closed November the 8th, where what we're doing, we're jacking a new pipe under 57. We've had a lot of flooding problems right there at Cunningham Tire. So, we hope to be able to take care of that with this project. And uh, the last on my list will be receiving bids November the 1st for a pipe replacement um, under Railroad Lane. That was also flood damage that happened uh, back last fall. And that's all I had. Does anyone have anything uh, to ask of Lisa prior to us taking up uh, 17A? I think Lisa would probably tell you she's probably already already fielded about 30 questions she got it to the podium. All right. Well, that's great. Uh, thank you for opening that line of communication. Uh, 17A um, 
is an acceptance of a right-of-way to facilitate the addition of DuPont Road into the secondary road system. Mr. Hall. Currently, only a portion of DuPont Road is in the state's secondary road system, with a new adult detention center opening in April, another development in the works at the DuPont campus. It would be beneficial to have the entire road in the state's secondary road system so that VDOT could maintain it. Several steps must be taken in order for the state to accept it into the system. The first step is that the current owner, EI DuPont Company, must deed the road right away to Henry County. Once Henry County owns it, improvements can be made to the road to make it suitable for acceptance by VDOT. Funding for these upgrades is part of the construction budget for the new adult detention center and will be eligible for 25% reimbursement from the Commonwealth. Staff asked the board to approve the deed transferring the DuPont Road right away from EI DuPont <coughs> to Henry County, and that proposed deed is in your working paper. What is the pleasure of the board in regard to acceptance of this right away? Mr. Chairman, I make a motion that the board accept the property transfer from EI DuPont uh, for the DuPont right of way. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor is 6 0, Jennifer. <coughs> That takes us to agenda item 18, public hearing on a rezoning application R-20-07-JRS Realty Partners, LLC. We have with us our Director of Planning and Zoning, uh, Lee Clark. Mr. Clark. Okay. This property is located at 100 Marshall Way. It's in the Horse Pasture District. Tax rate number is 40.2, lot 75. The applicant here is requesting the rezoning of approximately two and three quarter acres from Commercial District B1 to suburban residential district. The developer plans to convert the building into residential apartment units. Once rezoned, an approved special use permit is also required from the Henry County Board of Zoning Appeals, and this public hearing is scheduled for tomorrow at 1 p.m. in this same room. Following a public hearing, both the Planning Commission and staff recommended that this rezoning request be approved. I'll open the public hearing at 6.05 p.m. Take any input. Does anyone wish to speak in regard to this uh, application? Mr. Chairman? Yes. I'm Pat Sharp. I'm here with uh, James Cherney. He is with uh, JRS Realty. Uh, he'd be happy to answer any questions that anyone might have about the project. I think uh, everything is in order, but I thought I would just recognize him at this time. Thank you for your time. All right. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? I will close the public hearing at 6.05. Ms. Buchanan, I believe this is in your district. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I certainly hope that these apartment units will be a benefit to, uh, to that area. Um, and so I move that the board um, approve the rezoning as requested. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All in favor? It is 6-0. Uh, Jennifer? Agenda item 19, matters presented by the public. Do we have anyone wishing to address the board under matters presented by the public? Okay, I see several hands. Uh, yes, I'll, let me read a policy statement just briefly. Uh, it won't take just a moment. This is a time for public comment. We welcome your participation in tonight's meeting. Uh, we're here to listen to you. If, uh, if you care to uh, address the board, come to the podium, state your name, your subject matter, and the district in which you live. By coming to the podium, you have agreed that you will exhibit respect for the board and its members. You will receive the same consideration from the board. Please try to keep your presentation three minutes to five minutes. Sure. I'm Eric Phillips. I'm from the IRS with the district. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, board, county administrator. I just want to say I really do appreciate um, the urgency in which you guys and Ms. Buchanan acted along with the, the county staff and, and trying to uh, expedite uh, you know, Sheriff Perry's request and also the public safety stuff. I know the last meeting uh, was an odd, an odd meeting. It felt like a drug on and it got a little heated in the end. Um, but I will say uh, that I, I certainly was not advocating for a vote that night. I was just advocating to hear that we had a sense of urgency and we weren't going to study it or as one of your members says, we wanted to put a dollar amount on it and get onto it because I felt like um, for, for Sheriff Perry to come in here and ask for it that night, he felt a sense of urgency. Sometimes sitting in the audience, I could feel a sense of urgency sitting close to the officers and I could kind of feel uh, <laughs> the mood in the room. 
And so uh, I want to say thank you for, for doing that. I, I, I hope it wasn't, and I didn't mean to imply that any of you don't care about public safety or our officers or, or anything like that. So uh, thank you. And uh, this is the last meeting before an election, so I do want to say that uh, I think Henry County has good, honest folks on the board, and I think that that will continue uh, ever how these elections go. So I appreciate uh, what you do. And I will also say, one of the things you guys have done well under Mr. Hall and Mr. Heath's leadership is economic development. You know, obviously we've had a lot of positive uh, economic news, which is good for everything that goes on in Henry County. Uh, a famous politician said, you know, a rising tide raises all boats. So, you know, when the economy's going well, schools do better, taxes, revenues go up, and so it can only benefit Henry, Henry County uh, for those things to take place. So. Uh, thank you for your time and have a good evening. Yeah, I saw the lady uh, at the back. Yes. Good evening, everyone. I'm Anita Gravely, and I'm from the Irishwood District. I was here earlier today on behalf of the Henry County Juvenile Court. First, I want to thank Dr. Martin for all your efforts in trying to get us help, and I would like to thank uh, Ryan Zare for your vote. I knew I would not rest until I spoke. And I'm back to ask one question for the members who did not vote for us. Why? We were included in the $250 vaccine. The county sent an email. Anyone that had received the vaccine, you would receive $250. We were included in on that. We're state employees. Why couldn't we get this? Our work is, our work uh, is very hard. We contribute over $100,000 to this county. Each time a deputy writes a summons, he has to put the Henry County local code on it. We have to collect the money. It falls on our shoulders. Mr. Slaughter stated earlier in addressing the Henry County Sheriff's Office, until you walked in my shoes. So having empathy for the Sheriff's Office, he votes for that proposal. I can make the exact same statement until you've walked in our shoes. I wish each of you could spend one day in the Henry County Juvenile Court. It is a tiresome, it is a gruesome and thankless job. We left the meeting earlier today in shock. We felt worthless, we felt dejected, we felt as if no one cared. I know some of you at some point has watched the movie Christmas Vacation and this came to mind. Paul Griswold is waiting for his bonus at the end of the year. He's making all these plans. He's going to install a swimming pool so the family can enjoy it. Well, along comes his nephew. And Clark realizes they're not going to get this bonus. Instead, they're getting a card for the Jelly Club of the Month. So his nephew decides that he was going to go to the CEO's home. He ties him up. He brings him back to Clark. Well, his wife, the CEO's wife, when she discovers what he's done, she scolds him. How could you do such a thing? The police officers that arrive on the scene, how could you do such a thing? I know the folks at the top make the ultimate decisions for us little folks, and we have to accept it. I know you won't respond to my question. Why? However, I want to answer your thoughts. I want you all to answer your thoughts in your mind. And if you have any inclination of what is right, I would hope you could revisit this. And I thank you for your time. Is there anyone else wishing to address the board on the matters? Yes, sir. <coughs> Good afternoon. Andrew Palmer, residing in the Council District in Henry County. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Hall, uh, I wasn't going to say anything this afternoon, but I just thought, you know, that I would just come up and just 
briefly speak, uh, as Mr. Phillips mentioned as well, you know, it's been uh, been election season. I know there's been a lot of uh, emotions uh, that have risen, and uh, I do appreciate the Henry County Board of Supervisors responding to the request of the Henry County Sheriff's Office to uh, to help them out um, until uh, June of um, 2022. And then, you know, as, as the board will then take up the measure and uh, vote onto it and put into their uh, budget for next year. Um, but I would just like to say that I do uh, consider uh, everyone on the Henry County Board of Supervisors a friend. I mean, I think I have talked with everyone on the board uh, in my private sector position uh, over the years, and I think that everyone has a, um, everyone on the Henry County Board of Supervisors does intend for the best of Henry County. And if I've ever said anything that uh, was offensive, I do apologize. I do think that everyone wants Henry County to um, prosper and be the best place to work, live, and build a family. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to address the board on the matters presented by the public? <coughs> Seeing and hearing no one, um, Mr. Hall, do you have any other items of business that the board needs to consider? No, sir. Board members, do you have any? Yes, sir. I will accept a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. Have a motion and a second. All in favor? Six zero, uh, Jennifer. Everyone have a good evening.